January the 3rd, 2016. You guys pay very close attention to what I'm about to tell you. Mainstream has covered this occasionally, but they butchered the truth. Now, if you remember a couple years ago on the Bundy Ranch, when uh, Harry Reid and his henchmen tried to take over Clyde Bundy's ranch and they've taken his cattle, one of the best YouTube videos I've ever seen in my life was when David with InfoWars took his camera crew under that bridge to the standoff, guns, and they were the uh, henchmen of Nevada and the U.S. government controlled by Harry Reid at that point, were forced to stand down and give them their cattle back. Amazing patriotic video. What's happened now, it's been going on for a little bit, but this is, has to do with the Hammond family in Oregon. 100 to 150 armed U.S. militia have taken over the Malheur National Wild, Wildlife Refugee Park headquarters. Now, this includes three of Clive Bundy's sons that have come to this area on this rescue mission. Two of the Hammond families who live there and their property's been taken over by the same group are to report to prison tomorrow for failure to hand it over and walk away. Now we've got 100 to 150 armed patriots. Some of these are military. Are you listening? Short summary of the story, in an effort to draw attention to a ridiculous arrest of a father and son pair of Oregon ranchers, Dwight Lincoln Hammond Jr., 73, and his son Stephen Dwight Hammond, 46, who were scheduled to begin five-year prison sentences, turning themselves into more January 4, 2016. Three brothers from the Clive and Bundy family and approximately 100 and 150 and growing, and growing, heavily armed militia, former U.S. service members have taken control of the Malheur Wildlife Refugee, I mean Refuge Headquarters in the Wildlife Refuge. They are prepared to stay there indefinitely. Guys, uh, <clears throat> the reason I'm doing this is so this won't turn into another Waco, if you understand what I'm saying. Now, a little history going back. The, the Horny Basin, where the Hammond Ranch is established, was settled in the 1870s. The valley was settled by multiple ranchers and was known to have run over 300,000 head of cattle. These ranchers developed a state-of-the-art irrigation system to water the meadows, and it soon became a favorite stopping place for migrating birds and their annual trek north. In 1908, Teddy Roosevelt created an Indian reservation called the Malheur Mud and Horny Lakes and declared it a preserve and breeding ground for native birds. Later, this Indian reservation, without Indians, and had no Indians there, became the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. In 64, the Hammonds purchased the ranch in the Horny Basin. The purchase included 6,000 acres of private property, four grazing rights on public land, a small ranch house, and three water rights. The ranch is around 53 miles south of Burns, Oregon. By the 70s, nearly all the ranches adjacent to the Blitzen Valley were purchased by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and added to the Malheur Wildlife Refuge. The refuge covers 187,000 acres and stretches over 45 miles long and 37 miles wide. The expansion of the refuge grew and surrounds uh, to the Hammond Ranch, being approached many times by the Fish and Wildlife Hammonds refused to sell. Other ranches also ranchers also chose not to sell. So they, the Fish and Wildlife came up with a different scheme in the 70s, and they went in with the Bureau of Land Management, BLM, that's who we dealt with, remember, in the Bundy situation, took a different approach to get the ranchers to sell. Ranchers were told that their grazing was detrimental to wildlife and must be reduced. 32 out of 53 permits were revoked, and many ranchers were forced to leave. Grazing fees were raised for those who were allowed to remain significantly. Refuge personnel took over the irrigation system, claiming it as their own. By 1980, a conflict was well on its way over water allocations on the adjacent privately owned Sylvie's Plain. Uh, Fish and Wildlife wanted to acquire the ranch 
on the Sealy's plane to add to their already vast holdings. Refuge personnel intentionally diverted the water, bypassing the vast meadowlands. Guys, how low down is that? Directing water into the rising Malheur Lakes. Within a few short years, the surface area of the lake doubled. 31 ranchers on the Silva Plains were flooded. Homes, corrals, barns, and grazelands were washed away and destroyed. The ranchers that once fought to keep the, floor, the fish and wildlife from taking their land now broken, destroyed, begged the fish and wildlife to acquire their useless ranches. One way to do it, huh? In 89, the waters began to recede, and now the once thriving, privately owned Sylvie's Plain are a proud part of the Ma Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. Now, in the 90s, the Hammonds were still hanging on, and what they did, they filed on a livestock water source and obtained a deed for the water right from the state of Oregon. When the Bureau of Land Management and the F U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service found out about that, near, they uh, were agitated and became belligerent and victim. Uh, vindictive toward the Hammonds. The Fish and Wildlife Service challenged the Hammonds' right to the water in an Oregon State Circuit Court. The court found that the Hammonds legally obtained rights to the water in accordance to state law and therefore the usage of the water belongs to the Hammonds. Then, August 1994, same group, Bureau of Land Management, Fish and Wildlife, they illegally began building a fence around the Hammonds' water source. Owning the water rights and knowing that the cattle relied on the water source daily, the Hammonds tried to stop the building of the fence. The BLL and FWS called the Harney County Sheriff Department and had Dwight Hammond, the father, arrested and charged with disturbing and interfering with federal officials or federal contractors, two counts each, both a felony. He spent one night in the county jail in Bend and a second night behind bars in Portland before he was hauled before the federal magistrate and released without a bail. A hearing on the charges was postponed, and the federal judge never set another date. The Fish and Game, they also began restricting access to upper pieces of the Hammonds' private property. In order to get the upper part of the Hammonds' ranch, they had to go on a road that went through the Malheur Refuge. Fish and Wildlife began barricading the road and threatening the Hammonds if they drove through it. Now, this was covered on mainstream news last year about them. They were not able to get to their property. Friends were stopped. It was like I'm going to Mexico or something. The road was proven later to be owned by the county of Harney. The, this further enraged the Bureau of Land Management and the Fish and Wildlife Services. Guys, think about what, what we're looking at. Think about the seriousness and the patriotic spirit of these people. They've had enough. The U.S. needs to be aware of this. This video is taking a few minutes, but the truth needs to be told. Shortly after the road and water disputes, the Bureau of Land and Management and the Fish and Wildlife Service revoked the Hammonds' upper grazing permit without giving calls, court proceedings, or court rulings. As a traditional fence out state, Oregon requires no obligation on the part of an owner to keep his or her livestock within a fence or to maintain control over the movement of the livestock. The Hammonds intended to still use their private property for grazing, however. Now, that put the Hammonds in a situation where they were forced to either build and maintain miles of fence or be restricted from the use of their private property, cutting their ranch almost in half. They could not afford the fence of land, so the cattle were removed. The Hammonds experienced many years of financial hardship due to the ranch being diminished. The Hammonds had to sell their ranch and home in order to purchase another property that had enough grass to feed their cattle. The property included two grazing rights on public land. They were also revoked later. The owner of the Hammonds' original ranch passed away from a heart attack, and the Hammonds made a trade for the ranch back, got it back. In the early fall of 2001, the son, Stephen, called the fire department, informing them that he was going to be performing a routine, routine prescribed burn on the ranch. Later that day, he started a prescribed fire on the private property. The fire went onto public land and burned 127 acres of grass. The Hammonds put the fire out themselves. That was, there was no communication about the burn from the federal government to the Hammonds at that time. Prescribed fires are a common method that Native Americans and ranchers have used in the air to decrease the health and productivity of the land for many centuries. It's gone on for thousands of years. 
Then in 2006, a massive lightning storm started multiple fires that joined together in flaming the country. In that area, it said to prevent the fire from destroying their winter range and possibly their home, Stephen Hammond started a backfire on the private property. They do it in California all the time, guys. You see the firefighters start that to create a barrier. The backfire was successful in putting out the lightning fires that covered thousands of acres within a short period of time. He saved that. The backfire saved much of the range and vegetation needed to feed the cattle through the winter. Stephen's mother, Susan Hammond, said the backfire worked perfectly. It put out the fires, saved the range, and possibly their home. The next day, federal agents went to the Horney County Sheriff's Office and filed a police report making accusations against Dwight and Stephen Hammond for starting the backfire. A few days after the backfire, Range Con from the Burns District Bureau of Land Management Office asked Stephen if he would meet him in town for coffee. Stephen accepted. When, he, when leaving, he was arrested. Listen, that's low down cowardly. When he was arrested by the Horney County Sheriff David Glearup and the Bureau of Land Management Ranger Orr. Now, guys, I realize that these federal people can come in and almost take over an area from the local law enforcement. I understand that. Sheriff Glearup then ordered him to go to the ranch and bring back his father. Both Dwight and Stephen were booked on multiple Oregon State charges. The Harney County District Attorney reviewed the accusation, evidences, and charges and determined that the accusations against Dwight and Stephen Hammond did not warrant prosecution and dropped all charges. The thieves wouldn't give up. Now, during this new administration that we have, in 2011, five years after that police report, the U.S. Attorney Office, Office accused Dwight and Stephen Hammond of completely different charges. They accused them of being terrorists under the Federal Anti-Terrorism Effective Death Penalty Act of 1996. This act carries a minimum sentence of five years in prison and a maximum sentence of death. Dwight and Stevens' mugshots were all over the news, the next week posing them as arsonists. That's what mainstream will do. They saved that area. Susan Hammond, the mother and the wife, I would walk down the street or go in a store, and people I'd known for years would take extreme measures to avoid me. You see what the mainstream media machine can do. That's why I'm doing this video. Shortly after the sentencing, Capitol Press ran a story about the Hammonds. A person who identified as Greg Allum posted three comments on the article calling the ranchers clowns who endangered firefighters and other people in the area while burning valuable rangeland. Now, Greg, turns out he was a retired Bureau of Land Management heavy equipment operator. Soon called Capitol Press to complain that he had not made those comments or request they be taken down. Capitol Press removed the comments. A search of the internet protocol address associated with the comments revealed it is owned by the Bureau of Land Management's office in Denver, Colorado. He, Alum said he is friends with the Hammonds and was alerted to the comments by neighbors who knew he wouldn't have written them. I feel bad for them. They lost a lot and they're going to lose more, Alum said of the ranchers. They're not terrorists. There's this hatred in the Bureau land management for them. Remember, he used to be a heavy equipment operator, but it didn't come from him. It came from the Bureau of land management. He said, I don't get it. The retired employee said that Jody Well, the deputy secretary director for communications at the Bureau of land management's Oregon office, indicated to reporters that if one of their agents falsified the comments, they would keep it private and not inform the public. Now, guys, just the year after the fire, in 2006, Dwight and Susan's home was raided. The agents informed the Hammonds they were looking for evidence that would connect them to the fires. The Hammonds later found out that a boot print and tire tracks were found near one of the many fires. No matching boots or tires were found in the Hammonds' home or on their property. Mrs. Hammond said, I have never felt so violated in my life. We are ranchers, not criminals. Stephen Hammond openly maintains his testimony that he started the backfire, 
to save the winter grass from being destroyed, and the backfire ended up working so well it put out the fire entirely. Now, the, the information I'm talking about, the, these patriots, these servicemen that are held up risking their lives, know this. That's why they're there. And during that trial, there was a federal court judge. His name was Michael Hogan. He didn't allow time for the certain testimonies and evidence into the trial that would have exonerated the Hammonds. The federal prosecutor, who was Frank Papagna, was given full access for six days, say anything. He had ample time to use any evidence or testimony that strengthened the demonization of the Hammonds. The Hammonds attorney was only allowed one day. Much of the facts about the fire's land and why the Hammonds acted the way they, they did was not allowed even to be presented and was not heard by the jury, guys. For example, Judge Hogan did not allow time for the jury to hear or review certified scientific findings that the fires improved the health and productivity of the land, or that the Hammonds had been subject to vindictive behavior by multiple federal agencies. Now, Frank Papagna, who was the federal attorney, he hunted down Dusty Hammond, the nephew and grandson of the people he was prosecuting. Dusty had had mental problems his whole life. He was 13 at the time of the fire and 24 when he testified 11 years later. He had been, they said he had been suffering with mental problems for many years. And at one point, Judge Hogan even noted that Dusty's memories as a 13-year-old boy were not clear or credible. But he had allowed this, the prosecution, Frank Papagna, to continue. And the, what Dusty had said is that he thought he had remembered that his uncle had told him to start the fire. Now, they were out there starting a backfire. When speaking to the Hammonds, now this is in court, about this testimony, they said they understood that Dusty was manipulated. They weren't holding anything against him. They felt love and they were trouble for their grandson and what he was going through. The information about that trial is saying that Judge Michael Hogan and Frank Papagno tampered with the jury many times throughout the proceedings, including during the selection process. Hogan and Papagna only allowed people on the jury who did not understand the customs and culture of the ranchers or how the land is used and cared for in the Diamond Valley. Although the juries had to drive back and forth to Pendleton every day, some drove more than two hours each way. By day eight, they were exhausted and expressed desires to be home. On the final day, Hogan, the judge, kept pushing them to make a verdict. Several times during the deliberation, Hogan pushed them to make this decision. Hogan also would not allow the jury to hear what punishment could be imposed upon an ind individual that had, was convicted as a terrorist under the 1996 Act. The jury, not understanding the customs and our culture of the area, influenced by the prosecutors for six straight days, exhausted, pushed for a verdict by the judge, unaware of the ramifications of convicting someone as a terrorist, made a verdict and went home. This was almost demonic harassment. So the jury found them guilty. The judge convicted them both as terrorists, again under the Anti-Terrorism Act. Judge Hogan sentenced Dwight, father, to three months in prison and Stephen to 12 months in federal prison. They were also stipulated to pay 400000 to the Bureau of Land Management. And the reason he did it, guys, he was retiring that day. He lowered the sentence from the minimum five years. He said that would be cruel and unusual punishment. He had a party that day and went home. I guess that was just a little too much for a retiring judge to deal with. On January 4th, 2013, Dwight and Stephen reported to prison. They fulfilled their sentences. Dwight three months, Stephen 12 months. Dwight was released in March 2013 and Stephen in January 2014. They both manned up and did what the judge said. They didn't like it. But now listen, they, they got out. The, here comes June 2014. Rhonda Cargs, the field manager for the Bureau of Land Management, and her husband, Chad Cargs, refuge manager of the Malhu Wildlife Refuge. Guys, <laughs> Doesn't get any better than that, which surrounds the Hammond Ranch along with the attorneys Frank Papagna 
exemplifying further vindictive behavior by filing an appeal with the Ninth District Federal Court seeking Dwight and Stephen return to federal prison for the entire five years. That it just doesn't get any more low down than this. Maybe it will. We'll see. October 2015, the Ninth District Court resentenced Dwight and Stephen, requiring them to return to prison for several more years. Stephen, 46, has a wife, three kids. Dwight, 74, will leave Susan, 74, to be alone after 55 years of marriage. If he survives, he will be 79 when he's released. Not only like that, when they were called back and resentenced, the lawyer Papagnin, the new judge, made them hand over the first rights of the sale of their ranch. If the Hammonds ever sell the ranch, they would have to sell it to the BLM. You don't think they're going to try to take that while they're in jail? Dwight and Stephen were ordered to report to federal prison on January 4th, that's tomorrow, to begin their resentencing. Both their wives will have to manage the ranch for several years without them. I bet you, if this doesn't lead to full, outright, civil, uh, revolutionary war, there will be many patriots. Those two women will not be there alone. Now, during this time, between the two trials, the Bureau of Land Management has already forced them to pay half of that 400000 They've paid them $200,000 while struggling. And the remainder of the 200000 must be paid before the end of this year which was a couple of days ago. This was in the original readings. If the Hammonds cannot pay the fines to the BLM, they will be forced to sell the ranch to the BLM or face further prosecution. Now you know why the Patriots are there. What happened? A protest rally supporting the Hammond, Hammond family yesterday. A pre-planned group, including the Bundy brothers, left a peaceful protest at the Harney County Sheriff's Office and went to the close for the holidays, Mile Hill Wildlife Refuge, building where they have seized and occupied the refuge headquarters. Now be aware of this. This is a statement coming out of the Harney County Sheriff Dave Warp today. After the peaceful rally was completed, a group of outside militants drove to the Malheur Wildlife Refuge where they seized and occupied the headquarters. A collective effort from multiple agencies is currently working on a solution. For the time being, please stay away from that area. More information will be provided as it becomes available. Please maintain a peaceful and united front and allow us to work through this situation. Do you guys remember what happened in Waco? But the real story needed to be told. Guys, pay attention to this very closely. Send any information, bring it in on the comments. A lot of people are going to be interested in this. You guys in that area, heads up. Be safe.